Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is indeed a good thing to be in the house of the Lord. And we thank the Lord for the privilege that we have to be in his courts one more time. Today we have a lesson to go through as we continue to look to the word of the Lord. We have lesson number 11, which is entitled, His Faithfulness. So is the Lord faithful to us? Amen. Is the Lord indeed faithful? Amen. Praise the Lord. Because, you know, many things are happening around us. And though others may not recognize the hand of the Lord, we have the advantage to be able to, to look to the Lord because He is indeed faithful towards us. So as we continue to bask in His goodness towards us and continue to recognize that He is indeed a faithful God to us, we continue just giving Him thanks, recognizing that we are indeed His people. And as we said, we are the sheep of his pastors. And we can continue to recognize that he is indeed a faithful God. Yes. So, as we look to this lesson, which is entitled, His Faithfulness. Not the faithfulness of man, or the faithfulness of kings, or the monarch, or any other dominion but the faithfulness of the Lord God Almighty. We did the readings which would have bearing on our lesson taken from Nehemiah chapter 9 from verse 28 through to 33. We have Deuteronomy 7 from verse 6 to 11 and we also had Psalm 89 from verse 1 through 8. Very relevant passages as we look at the faithfulness of our Lord and King. The key words that are dominant in today's lesson are as follows. They are mercies, covenant, fidelity, and sin. These are again mercies, covenant, fidelity, and sin. I want to pause here as we seek to go into our introductory passage to welcome those who have joined us online. We have Sincon Nelson. Vidal Tabian, and uh, we also have Cecilia Lori Johnson, and we have others that are seeking to join us as we seek to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I'm going to be inviting Sister Gordon to come forward and to read or passage, think about it. A passage which gives insight of that which we are here to study. Sister God. Think about it. We don't read lamentation much. It is a lament after all. The weeping prophet's letter of grief. Jerusalem is burned, the temple torn down, Israel is slain or in captivity. Her sin has overtaken her, the covenant is shattered. In this darkest hour, we don't expect Jeremiah to offer a gem of hope amid the ruins, but he does. In this mostly avoided book in the Bible, a most beloved passage shines forth. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because
because his compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. By all appearances, hope should be crushed, but here it is alive and well, because Jeremiah knows the truth about God. Despite the circumstances and Israel's unfaithfulness, God remains faithful. It is a core covenant conviction across all ages. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. God's commitment and its relationship to the covenant is noted at the start. God is reliable because the Lord loves you and because he will keep the oath which he swore to your fathers. It's who God is. The Lord, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. We learn in lesson six, we learned in lesson six that no word says relationship like covenant. And we define the divine covenant as a sacred bond forged in a sacrifice. No word is more basic to that bond and is necessary for preserving it than faithfulness. In a free, loving relationship between God and Israel, loving fidelity ensures the covenant continuance. Faithfulness is a mutual obligation that safeguards all relationships. It categorizes, it categorizes marriage, especially this divine bond. Sadly, Israel's long relationship with a loving husband was rarely mutual and usually one-sided. While Israel persistently played the harlot, God upheld the covenant in faithfulness. She would wander and sell herself, but God would take her back and renew covenant by his mercies and faith, even after the great divorce of exile. Nehemiah poignantly lamented this sad cycle as he cried out again for his people. Many times you delivered them according to your mercies, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have done wickedly. Nehemiah 9, 28 to 33. Many times Israel's infidelity separated her from God's blessing and life in covenant, but he is trustworthy. Many times he rescued her from curse and death to restore the relationship. That's why his faithfulness is called great. Noticeably, each of our texts links God's faithfulness with his mercies. It is a covenant pair revealed to Moses and often used to summarize God's nature and faithful love for his people. Mercy and truth, steadfast love and faithfulness. However, you translate the Hebrew, however you translate the Hebrew, he said and Emmet, these two are God's promise that when we are lost and in need of help, God sends forth his love, mercy, and his faithfulness, truth. Grace and truth is now the New Testament trans sorry, grace and truth is how the New Testament translates this essential nature of our loving Father and the only begotten whom he sends to reveal him. John 1, 14 to 18. Praise the Lord. All right, we thank Sister Gordon for the able way in which she was able to read this introductory passage to our lesson. Um, it really is a, a, a different type of reading because we, it took us to some passages that we don't often read, you know. Not every day we read Deuteronomy. Not every day or even that much do we take up Nehemiah to read. For some persons, as they write out the passage says, Sometimes we look at it and we say, boy, you know, it's like a dreary book because this man is just weeping and it's, it's all sadness and gloom. 
but there are things that we can look at in it, you know. The passage that was referred to is a passage that some persons have actually put to song, you know, and um, sometimes we hear songs and we, 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 we sing them and they are memorable, but we don't even know where in the Bible they are from. Sometimes it shows how much we actually read through the scriptures, eh? So we'll go into the portion of the questions from our lesson. This first part is based on the introductory passage. Answer it, it's called. There are three questions that are asked based on the passage and we will now pose them and we will invite our congregation to respond filling in the blanks to these passages. The first one says, despite circumstances and Israel's blank, God remains blank. Alright, so someone responds and says the first blank should be unfaithfulness and the second blank faithful. So that would read, despite, let's read it together, despite and Israel's unfaithfulness, God remains faithful. Alright, a very, very potent verse because, um, you know, so many times we look around in society and we say, boy, who can we trust? Who can we have faithful? Who can we be faithful to? But in this passage it says, despite the circumstances around Israel's unfaithfulness, God remains faithful. And we can take it home to our personal situation. Despite the things that are happening around the world today, God is still God. And one of his characters is the faithful God. Eh? Amen. So the second says, God's plan and its relation to the plan is noted at the start. Is there anyone who has the answer to this one? So, commitment and covenant is upward. So let's read it together. God's commitment and his relation to the is noted at the start. Right. And we did a lesson, I think it was lesson number six, in which we spoke of the covenant keeping God. Eh? And it has some bearing on questions that we will look into today. Alright, so number three says faithfulness is a blank, blank that safeguards our relationships. Mutual obligation. Mutual obligation. Alright, so let's read it together. It says Faithfulness is a mutual obligation that safeguards all relationships. Praise the Lord. So, it's not just relationship with God and us. But even in the sphere where we have our individual relationships, faithfulness is one of the hallmarks that will sustain our relationship. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So let's move now to page 38 in our quarterly. And at the top it lists some words or a phrase that speaks to our lesson. It says, loving fidelity ensures covenant continuance. Loving fidelity ensures covenant continuance. Praise the Lord. Loving fidelity. By the way, what does fidelity mean? Is there anyone who wants to give an opinion? You know, I'm 
Faithfulness. Faithfulness in a marriage and union. Alright. Now, sometimes in, in, in understanding what a word means, sometimes we end up looking at what the opposite is. So there's a word which is noted as infidelity. What does infidelity mean? Disloyal, unfaithfulness. unfaithfulness. Anything else? Come we use it a lot, you know. We sometimes use it in the context of relationships, where we say that the person has committed infidelity. So we say that this person has broken the the union, they have, based on their actual actions, they have dishonored the union. So the person has committed infidelity. So fidelity speaks to the opposite of that. It speaks to acts or actions that seeks to ensure that the union stays intact. It so ensures that whatever the relationship is, it continues to be binding. So if it is that we find ourselves doing things that are anti the union, then we are committing infidelity. We didn't see that at all the time, did we? But it holds true. So loving fidelity ensures covenant continuance. And if you look at this passage, it seems like some of these words are almost overlapping. Because when there is fidelity, it shows that there is a covenant. When there, you can't have unloving fidelity. But because you love, then your actions will be of fidelity. And it will be in line with your covenant. And because of that, it ensures that there is continuance. It continues. You know, the actions will ensure that there is strengthening of the union. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So let's look at it some more. Let's talk about it. That's the, the topic of this passage where we'll look at different um, questions. We have three main questions that we will look into. And we hope that you will follow us. Now, for this first question, we are asked to examine the key text that we, we looked at earlier, before we came online. So we look at Lamentation 3, verse 23, which it's not in the key text, but we we'll look at this passage. We also look at Nehemiah 9, 28 to 23, Deuteronomy 7. 6 to 11, and Psalm 89 from verse 1 to 8. Alright, so can we have a reader for Lamentation 3 verse 23, and then we'll look at Nehemiah 9, 28 to 23, Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 11, and Psalm 81, sorry, Psalm 89 from 1 to Eight. All right. Lamentations three, verse twenty-three. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Praise the Lord. So they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Sounds like a song we sing, don't it? Yes. Praise the Lord. You know, we sing and we say that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So we're reading this passage. We're reading the passages. A little bit different. We're reading the passage and then we ask the question. Yeah? So let's look at uh, the other passage, Nehemiah 9, 28 to 
33, another reader. Okay, Sister Hamilton will read.
because see, faithfulness seems to be a little bit different. What is faithfulness? Anyone? All right, be loyal, be true. Then the other one. Oh, be genuine. All right, so, right, so someone who is faithful is genuine in character. Right, right. So, 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 see that we have looked at this. We see that someone who is faithful is loyal, someone who is faithful is genuine, someone who is faithful is true in terms of their character and their action. So let's let's look look at the other part of it now. A covenant life. And this is where now we'll ask evangelists to come to, to come and to shed some light. We discuss the matter of a covenant life. How does mercy and faithfulness impact a covenant life? Looking back on good morning class, so happy so well. Looking back on lesson six that speaks, they have the key words are promise, bond, faithful, blessing. And well, you know what? This lesson speaks to speaks to God's faithfulness. So the, the, the words here are mercy, covenant, fidelity, sin. Lesson six speak to the covenant that God is willing and more than able to share with his people that he has made with his people and a covenant is an agreement in reality or in reality a covenant is an agreement that is made between more than one person so marriage is also a covenant um, work Ethics are laws that we, we employ at our workplaces are also covenant. It means that you do what you are supposed to do, what you are pledged to do, and the other party does the same. Covenant sometimes are what, what I would call H or engraving law. And the, the laws that are used to bind them together. The truth is that God has given laws and these laws bind them, but his laws are engraved in love. So the covenant that God wants us to have is one that is in love. The faithfulness of God is that he will never move away from his covenant. All that he has promised to do, all that he has said, he will continue to do. The other part is that many times as people we have moved away from God. But the faithfulness of God, or how that is etched in faithfulness, is that He still remembers and He loves. He looked at us and He saw that we have failed and we have become so far from it, but He still willing. When we cry to Him, He brings us back. So, in, in, in essence, what the covenant does, the covenant is made in God's faithfulness. So he is the main architect and the main character. And this, and, but he makes it with failing men. But he's always making, showing love and making utterances are extending a hand to bring us in. Because the covenant consistently breaks on the side of men. Men will never keep it. Men has never kept it. Men has always been faith, unfaithful. If, if, fidel, infidelity is something that shows up very often in our nature. But the God of heaven who doesn't change all his other faithful stands and he ensures his of that stands to the end. So where faithfulness is regarded, it is God is, not us. He's all faithful and all good. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I want someone to read Deuteronomy 7 from verse 6 to 11. Can I ask Sister Mark? Oh, Sister Kristen is, is on the floor. Let's allow her to read. And this would be like sealing this question. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, 
The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in numbers than any people. For you were fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your father, had the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondment from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, therefore, that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God which keepeth covenant and mercy with them, that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, and repay them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hated him. He will repay him to his face. 11. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgment which shall command thee these days to die. Praise the Lord. No, isn't that a covenant keeping God? It starts off by saying that I have chosen you. You didn't do anything to be chosen. So out of the love of God, he has chosen to engage the people. And based on this, he says, all right, see that I have chosen you. This is all that I ask for you to do. You see these statues? Just keep them. That's your show of appreciation. And once you do that, you honor your level of covenant. So when we look at the whole matter of mercy and faithfulness, it was, it was God who is merciful. It is He who is faithful. Because He has created His statutes and says, okay, if you do this, this will happen. But if you don't do it, death is pronounced. And that was from creation. So from creation, death has been pronounced upon man. But then God says, you know what? I am still a merciful God. I will set aside judgment of death if you turn to me. So he has put himself, stepped down from his throne on high in the person of Jesus Christ and laid down himself a sacrifice, sealing that covenant relationship through his blood and says, okay, just accept this gift and walk in my way and that's all that matters so simple praise the lord praise the lord so in establishing this covenant life we are asked to recognize the sacrifice of the one who made the covenant and recognize that the covenant is not one side it's mutual we have an obligation just as our God has put himself out to us. So we move on to the next question in this discussion. What is the nature and emphasis of Jeremiah and Nehemiah's lament? So we look at these passages. Let's look broadly in Nehemiah 3, sorry, in Nehemiah 9 and Lamentation 3. We read from Nehemiah earlier and we read a passage from Lamentation. But let's look broadly in these passages and tell us what do you see coming out as the nature and emphasis of the lament of these two prophets. I don't know if Brother McDonald wants to chime in at this point. Evangelist? No, I was reading the question aloud. Were oh, you reading the question aloud? Um, what is the nature and emphasis of Jeremiah's and Nehemiah's lament? Uh, it's what we have been saying from the 
longest while, God is always faithful. But how we are so wretched in our actions and behavior. The nature of both Jeremiah and, and Lam um, Jeremiah's lamentation, Jeremiah was there at the beginning. He saw everything that took place in Israel and he saw in Judah that is and a portion of the tribe of Benjamin. And he saw all that took place. All the things that they did, all the problems, all the sin, all the injustices. And then he went, went, when he begged them, up to this week I was just reading a couple of chapters in Jeremiah. Not lamentation, and he was begging Zedekiah the king. Humble yourself before the king of Babylon. Don't resist, don't do the things that will make him hungry. He's coming. The word of the Lord came to him and said, the Babylon is going to take this city and burn it with fire. Humble yourself, go. He said, Every man who goes out to them will be saved. And the truth is that they resisted. And they were killed. His sons were killed before his very eyes. His eyes were put out and he was put in chains. And then the city was burned, the temple was destroyed, the city was burned. So the lamentation is that Jeremiah said, because of our sin, Lord, we will look at this place, how oh, it was so great, how oh, it was so wonderful. And because of our sin, this has been fallen us. It's the same thing that Nehemiah was saying. It's because of our sin and our wretchedness. It's not like you're all wicked to us. And if you listen to, to, to Deuteronomy, Moses was saying to them, it's not that you were big and special, but God chose you because he loved you. So why couldn't you just humble yourself and live up to God's will? And that is where the lamentation is. Because of our wretchedness and our sin, all is evil. Can you imagine all this evil that we are now seeing, all this evil life desolate, wasted without inhabitants and without men. The once beautiful, magnificent temple built by Solomon has come to be wounded and destroyed all because of sin. So that's the nature of their lamentation because we have failed God that has allowed the enemy to come in and punish us. Alright. So at this time we're going to be going into it a little bit deeper. So we want to expose ourselves to lamentation free. It's, it, you know, it seems as if we don't really go that much into lamentations. We seem to be more familiar with Jeremiah. So we're going to go. Let me just a little, it's a little, little bit on the lengthy side, but we're going to ask Sister Gordon to read as quickly as she can, and um, we'll see how best we can pull from it what this prophet was saying. Sister Gordon. Sorry, three. I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He had led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me is he turned, and he turned his hand against me all day. My flesh and my skin had he made old, and he had broken my bones. He had built against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He had set me in dark places as they that be dead or old. He had hedged me about that I cannot get out. He had made my chain heavy. Also, when I cry and shout, he shut it out my prayer. He had enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He had made my path crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait, and as a lion in secret places. He had turned aside my ways and put me in pieces. He had made me desolate. He had bent his bow and sent me as a mark for the arrow. He had caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. He was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. He had filled me with bitterness. He had made me drunken with wormwood. He had also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He had covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far from your peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul had then still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, 
because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saves my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is God, sorry, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. He sitteth alone and keepeth silent, because he hath borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust, if so be there may be hope. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is filled full with reproach, for the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor, nor grieve the children of men. To crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth, turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High. To subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. Who is he that sin? And it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not. Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not even and good. Wherefore does a living man complain? a man for, for the punishment of his sins. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts with our hands unto God in the heavens. We have transgressed and have rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned. Thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us. Thou hast slain, thou hast not pitied. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud, that our curse should not pass through. Thou hast made us as, as the offscoring, and refused in the midst of the people. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Fear and a snare is come upon us, desolation and destruction. Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water, for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth not without any intermission. Till the Lord looked down and behold from heaven, mine eye affected mine heart because of all the daughters of my city. Mine enemies chased me sore like a bird without cause. They have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast a stone upon me. Waters flowed over my head. Then I said, I am cut off. I call upon thy name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. Thou hast heard my voice, hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. Thou doest near in the day that I call upon thee, thou said, fear not. O Lord, thou hast plead the cause of my soul, thou hast redeemed my life. O Lord, thou hast seen my wrong, judge thou my cause. Thou hast seen all their vengeance and all their imaginations against me. Thou hast heard their reproach, O Lord, and all their imaginations against me. The lips of those that rose up against me and their device against me all the day. Behold, they are sitting down and they are rising up. I am their music. Render unto them a recompense, O Lord, according to the work of their hand. Give them sorrow of heart. They curse thy curse unto them. 66. Persecute and destroy them in anger from under the heavens of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we see a reading that stands out and it's a bit uncomfortable when we read it. We see some graphic display of dismemberment of body parts. We see, then it comes to a point where it speaks of the mercies of God and how the Lord is willing to restore. And then at some point it shifts to the enemies and what they have decided to do. Now, looking at this from a historical context, Jeremiah was a prophet that spoke to the, the destruction of Israel. He, he spoke to the fact that if the people did not hear God, some things would happen. The passage of time, the people of Israel 
they were driven off into captivity. And then while in captivity, a period of time passed. And then Nehemiah was one who was part of that. What's, what's that word? The, 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 the exodus from captivity back to the land of, of, of Israel. Where the rebuilding started to take place. So we see where Ezra and Nehemiah would have come into play, seeking to rebuild the walls, seeking to rebuild the temple, seeking to reconstitute worship. So when we look at this, the nature and the emphasis of the readings of these two prophets, we see where the faithfulness of God was evident. God is faithful even as he sought to administer punishment. God said, walk before me and be those circumspect. Follow these statutes. The people drifted and they went off into idolatry. They were led away. They went on intermarried with tribes of different and varied places which they were instructed not to do. They profaned the laws of God. They secreted the temple. They profane the Sabbath and so on. And the Lord said, Because you have done this, I sent a prophet to warn you. They did not take heed. Therefore, what was prophesied, the calamity, took place on the people. But the Lord said, I will not allow the people that I have placed in covenant with to just waste away like that. There comes a time when the mercies and the faithfulness of God in his covenant relationship will say, oh, it is time to bring the people that I have covenant with back to their land that I have sworn to their forefathers that I will establish them as a nation. Isn't this a faithful God? Isn't this a merciful God? Because indeed, God will do what he says. And even, you know, just as though it is said in, 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 in the Old Testament that I will visit the iniquity on the third and fourth generation. What is also significant? God made a promise to Abraham that I will multiply your seed like what? The sand of the sea. Abraham was not alive when that came to fulfillment. But the promise stood sure and it occurred to the point where we as Gentiles are now engrafted in the fellowship under the seed of Abraham and the blessing is extended to us. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, the evangelist has a point to me so we'll allow him at this time. And just a quick point, sir, it's, it's um, with all of God's faithfulness. You see, when God says something, He's faithful in His word and He's faithful in judgment and justice. And I notice in Jeremiah's lamentation, He said that you have put a cloud around that our prayers cannot even reach for you. They were lamenting when they, they did the destruction come, but God said you have to spend 70 years because of your sin. And they had to spend the 70 years. Despite God's mercy and his truth, that's where the lamentation is so hard because what Jeremiah was actually saying and Nehemiah, this was necessary. We were all enjoying your blessing, but because of our unfaithfulness. So now we have to go back to build a city and a temple and to build back all the systems that were torn down. But in the midst of that, they are saying, you are still faithful because what you could have done, you could have treated us as a other nation. We come and know and nobody remember us. But God was faithful in all of that. And His faithfulness shown to it. Praise the Lord. So we now move to the penultimate 12, the, 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 the final question in this section. And it asks, how great is thy faithfulness? In a sense, how great is the faithfulness of God? When we say great is thy faithfulness, we're actually lifting a passage, a, 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 a phrase from, from the book itself, which speaks to God. Eh? So when we ask the question, how is great is thy faithfulness? 
meaningful to your experience. So we're getting into the granular part of it now. How does it apply to us? And I will now invite Brother Mandela to make his contribution. I think he was getting away, eh?
I was just looking back, there are so many times that I have fallen. There are so many times that I have not carried out my end of the bargain, not being faithful, not being true. And yet God remains faithful. And that means the world to me because it tells me that I have a father that I can count on. He, he, he doesn't reward me according to my faithfulness. And you know, it's something that I really embrace that no matter what, God is not gonna He's not gonna reward me based on on on, on how you know how committed I am um you know from time to time. He remains constant and so it just tells me that I need to try as best as possible to keep my end of the bargain, to be obedient, to walk in his it is it is to walk in obedience and to do whatever he will have me to do because no matter what he will never um go big beyond because faithfulness is who he is and so i just you know thank him for being faithful to me and it encourages me to keep going on sister francis Same question.
you know, you will be in a situation before time. You want this up, you want this up, you know, and then it no go your way, right? And it's so upset, it's so disappointed because this is really one. And then later on, something is pop up way better than something um, you have your mind how you want, you know? And I say that to God said to you guys, um, God always has something better in store, right? And great is thy faithfulness. His faithfulness is greater than everything, right? And we supposed to just trust him, you know? I know that he will deliver in the way you want it to be, you know? And it will come, come through at the end in the best way possible, ways that you can ever imagine. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, just in case persons wonder if it's only the bright persons among us can speak about the faithfulness of God, eh? Every single one of us can speak about the faithfulness of God. Because it's not God for those who can read and answer the questions from the book and have a lot to say. But every one of us have a personal experience of the faithfulness of God. That's what makes us to be part and part of this great communion, this great fellowship. You know, where the greatness of God is not too great to be unfaithful to us. You know, sometimes persons, you know, some like to make it out of the politicians. But we see them when it's time for election. Or we might not see them again. You know, when it's time for election, they walk the street, they knock on your gate, knock on your door, shake your hand, ask you how you're doing, you know? They want to meet and greet and know you. They really want you. But in all said and done, what they really want is your vote. But God, all He wants us to, to do is to accept Him. Because He has allowed everything to be available. So our faithfulness yes. cannot be compared with His faithfulness. But it's because of His faithfulness why we can still be called members of the household of faith. Because if it was up to the law, the scripture says, all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we all deserve the punishment of death because the wages of sin is death. But because of his mercy and love, and faithfulness. The key words of this lesson were mercies, covenant, fidelity, and sin. And if you notice, there are four words, but only one is negative, sin. So this set of words are more unbalanced the side of the positive. Faithfulness, mercy, fidelity. They all cover sin. The scripture says that love covers a multitude of sin. Eh? So no sin is so great that the love of God can't reach and dispel us from. So as we wrap this lesson, we are asked to make the application, we are asked to make a prayer. And we are asked to sing a song. But we leave the song until later on. Alright? So we'll end at the Sabbath school when the presider comes with this song. But um, it says, set up this week to recognize 
and journal all the ways that God has shown himself faithful in our lives. Or I tell you that we need a big list. Can you imagine we sit down with a book and try to write out the goodness of God to us from a bar till now? We might end up back at the store buying more books. Because the one book can't do it. Given that our covenant relationship in Christ is mutual, identify specific ways to reciprocate faithfulness in love. And as we seek to demonstrate the love of God, we are mindful that our love is not just to God, but it's also to our fellow men. And it says in, in John, by this shall all men know that they are my disciples, because they do what? They love one another. So if there is any way in which we have a doubt in determining how we shall show our faithfulness to each other because of the faithfulness of God, just think about how can I love my brother, my neighbor, not just my friend. And we will be able to show forth the love of God in this life. I thank you for being with us. We'll now ask the presenters to come forward as we seek to continue the latter part of Sound School.
Bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. We would like to welcome back the McDonald family. Bless the Lord. Sister C. Gordon. Praise the Lord. And I would like to welcome one and all. Welcome to today's service. Bless the Lord.
Oh God and my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion. Hallelujah. Amen. Never fail. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Praise the Lord. Father, we humble ourselves this morning before you. Fully aware and believe that thou art God and that there is none like you. Praise the Lord. We thank you that you are the God of all gods. That you are the King of all kings. Praise the Lord. One writer declared that all other gods are idols. Praise the Lord. They are the creature that was created by you. And so we worship you this morning. We praise you that we are alive. We praise you that we are well. Amen. Today as I come into your house, Father, I feel like I'm in Goshen. I feel, Lord, that with all the chaos that was happening in Egypt, that you have secured a place for us. Oh, blessed Redeemer. With all you do. Amen. Today, Lord, my spirit feels like I'm in Goshen. Yeah, Lord. Amen. With all the plagues and the pestilence that are on us, you have secured a place for your people. Amen. Where our spirit can be at rest. Amen. Where our minds can get off the news, our minds can get off the fear and the wonders, and to look full in your wonderful face. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You can take us for a moment from the chaos and the madness and the fears, and you can strengthen us to face that James before us. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> oh, your word said, hallelujah. Let not your heart be troubled. Amen. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise his holy name. And so, Lord, I miss the chaos in the world. The trouble and the turmoil that one ah, virus is bringing. We have a God who have foretold it to us that we would have times like this. But you will be our shield. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. David declare that it shall not come nigh our dwelling. Oh, praise the Lord. For you are our refuge and our strength. So we confident we took our taxi and we come here, Lord. For we will praise you amidst. Hallelujah. And in spite of. Praise him. We are going to praise you. Hallelujah. And no devil, and no, hallelujah, demons will detour your praise. For you have created this day for us to praise you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, Lord. Amen. If you could put your hand up to die for us, we are risking us to praise you. And it is for you, O oh God, amen, to protect us. But we are not holding our praise at home. We're coming into your house. And we're telling somebody online, amen, that your trust is not in man. Neither is your trust, hallelujah, in whatever retroviral drug that they're looking for. But our hope is in you. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, praise the Lord. We are not careful to listen to doctors and specialists because it is you who knelt down and breathed in our forefathers the breath of life and we became living beings. You control the oxygen that we breathe. And so you can purify it for us. Yes. Hallelujah. If you, God, can give the trees oxygen to give us yes, and give us carbon dioxide to give the trees, yes, you can control that which is. Yes, Hallelujah. Yes, 
Hallelujah. Amen. And so we are not fearful. We are joyful that today is the Sabbath of the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. And we will enter into your house with thanksgiving. And we're coming into your courts with praise. That this which is on us, Lord, you are able to keep it from spread. Hallelujah. 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 Hey Lord, hallelujah. Amen. Hey, Many times, Lord, we have seen where fear us and others threaten us. Yes. And when your people come together, maybe few in numbers. Yes. Hey, Amen. Threats against us. Hallelujah. Can turn. The Bible said, while they were praying, Peter came knocking. Yes. While we're gathering, Lord, we pray that your angel will put a hand over Jamaica. Yes. Yes. While we gather to worship, may an angel visit us. Yes, and even as we read about the lamentation of Jeremiah, yes, that even though we are a nation who is bloody, Jesus. a nation who is wicked, yes, a nation that deserves not to be spared, yes, but hallelujah, yes, show us your faithfulness yes, in the season we ask. Yes, show us your faithfulness, God. Yes, that your people will realize yes. again Amen. that you are a faithful God you, to us. Thank you for those who came out this morning. Yes, we cover their families right now in advance. Amen. We cover their children. Amen. Amen. We cover their homes. We cover their environment. Yes, we cover the people who they come in contact with. Jesus. That Father will be safe through this time. Give those who are worried confident yes, that they are serving a God who is competent enough to take, hallelujah, to take care of us. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, Lord. Many hearts are failing with fear. Yes. But we have a God who stands mighty and ready to defend us. Bless us. Move on with us through the course of the day. And may you bless those online we ask as well. In Jesus' name. Amen.